Good afternoon everybody, it's Ross Stisse aka The Bearded Broker coming live from coming live from the house uh, this week. I'm still not feeling too great so I don't want to be taking the loggy into the office but we've got some great questions. If you're watching live it's lovely to see you. If you're watching on YouTube which would now be pre-recorded then please like and subscribe to the channel because the further that we can go the more people that we can help. So let's dive into the questions for this week and uh, we'll take it from there. Question number one from Louise from Birmingham. So by the way, the Bearded Broker is here to help all first time buyers, all next time buyers, so that's someone that's selling a house and buying a house and anyone looking for a remortgage. Our aim is just to get rid of all the jargon and all the nonsense and just help people get onto the property ladder, either onto the first rung or as far up that rung uh, ladder they want to go. So Louise from Birmingham is asking, me and my partner have defaults on our credit files. The defaults are from 2019. We also use our overdraft a lot so our bank statements are, are also not ideal. Since 2019, we have been accepted for a new credit card and have not missed any payments since. Are we able to apply for a mortgage now or should we wait a couple of years more? <clears throat> I suppose we could break that down quite a lot, uh, Louise, to be honest, but uh, my, my first concern would be you've had a couple of defaults. Why, why was that? I would, want to, I would want to know more about that first. What happened? Why did it happen? Uh, you're in your overdraft a lot as well, which again, that would concern me, just, uh, just purely as a mortgage advisor. Uh, so you could probably get a mortgage at some point in the near future, depending on the size of deposit you have. If you had a, quite a chunky deposit, <coughs> there's a good chance you could get a mortgage. But... I would want to do more digging into your own finances. I would want to, like I said, dig into the defaults from the past. What happened and why did it happen? I would want to make sure that it doesn't happen again for your own benefit. And also, why are you in your overdraft all the time? Again, I'd want to dig into that. Are we spending too much money on things that we don't need to be spending money on? Uh, are we overspending on other things that we don't need to be spending money on? So I would want to get into that first, Louise and then establish a plan going forward. So depending on the size of deposit, if you have a big chunky deposit, 25% or more, there's a reasonable chance you could get a mortgage today, but the interest rate would, would, would be quite high. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> like I say, I'm, <coughs> I'm still not feeling very, very well, so apologies. So Louise, technically yes, but I would want to get more than uh, the nitty gritty first before I give you a proper answer. So hopefully that helps. Stephen from Edinburgh, <coughs> what are the pros and cons of buying a property under a limited company? So I think Stephen is maybe a property investor and uh, a lot of investors are now buying their properties, into buying them within a limited company. So Stephen Properties Limited would buy this property. It's, it's tax benefits. Ultimately, that is the benefits is from a taxation point of view it can be more tax efficient to buy a property within a limited company just the way the taxation laws have have gone i'll not get into that here because i'm not a tax expert so if you want tax advice you need to speak to someone who is a tax expert i can recommend someone if you wish but there are definitely benefits if you're buying several properties there's definite benefits in buying within a limited company if you're only buying one it tends to not be of benefit because the costs, fees and charges in the beginning tend to be a lot higher than if you were buying it under a normal, and under your own name, under a limited, uh, and not a limited company. So there are pros and cons, definitely, but it depends on your own individual circumstances and happy to chat about that more or anyone else that wants to chat about that more. I've done lots of both. So I've done lots of limited company buy to lets and I've done lots of normal in your own name buy to lets as well and we've got to weigh up the pros and cons and costs obviously so hopefully that answers your question Stephen. Jenny from Blackpool my partner and I are looking to buy a first home 
My partner is self-employed but is about to accept an employed position which has a six month probation period. The opportunity is too good to pass, but we also have found a property we love. Can we start the process now and how will this affect interest rates if we can even get a mortgage because of the job change? Not a problem at all, Jenny. You can accept the contract. Uh, your partner doesn't even have to have started that job yet. So as long as we've got a written contract signed by both sides, we can crack on with a mortgage straight away. If it's too good an opportunity to miss, don't miss it because we can we can have our cake and eat it. So we can get you a mortgage and you can have the new job. So that's not a problem as long as we've got a written contract from both sides for his new employment and a start date, obviously. Uh, typically, that start date can't be more than three months uh, in the future. So hopefully that helps you, Jenny. And then we've got Emma from excuse me, <coughs> Hammersmith. I have been trying to get a mortgage and our broker is asking for a ridiculous amount of paperwork. For those of you that are not entirely sure what a broker is, so you've got a mortgage lender, so let's use Nationwide as the mortgage lender, it's probably one of the better known brands. You've got Nationwide, who is the mortgage lender, and then you've got you, who is the client, and then you've got the mortgage broker, in between, so that's what I do, I'm a mortgage broker. So this mortgage broker, uh, who really, it's our job as mortgage brokers, we gather all the paperwork, we decide with you, you know, what you're looking to do, and then we establish if XYZ lender will accept you as an application. So a mortgage broker, like any other professional, get really, really good at the job and know which lenders do what and which other lenders don't do and, and suit your circumstances. So this broker is asking for a ridiculous amount of paperwork just to get a decision in principle. So a decision in principle, if you don't know, is a mortgage broker uh, will, will apply to a mortgage lender for a decision in principle. So that is pretty much a credit check at the very, very beginning. Uh, just to make sure that you can get a mortgage if you do so desire in the future. I appreciate my husband and I are self-employed, but I thought getting a decision in principle is fast. Is this normal? Well, Emma, it's a good question. That There's not really any normal. So typically, when we do a decision in principle, it depends on the circumstances of the person. To be honest with you, if I was dealing with you and there was two self-employed people, I tend to try and get the income, so they're called SA302s, so your, your self-assessment tax return. I like to get those up front because 99 times out of 100, the information that we get from you as the client is often not, doesn't match up once we actually get the paperwork in. So I know it's a pain, Emma, I, trust me, I know it's a pain. And I don't know what you mean by ridiculous amounts. So if he's asking for everything in sundry and the kitchen sink, then, then that's ridiculous. If he's only asking for your tax return documents, I think that is very reasonable. And I think that's been very diligent, uh, to be fair to your broker. It's very diligent because what you don't want is you saying to your broker, yes, our income is 50,000, for an example. And then your broker goes away, gets a decision in principle on that basis. Then two months time you find the property, you go back to the broker and then you provide that documentation for him to do a mortgage application and your income is only 40,000 or 30,000 because you, you've confused the top line sales with the gross profit or the net profit or, you know, and it, you've confused the numbers somewhere because, you know, a lot of people do, uh, to be honest with you, they take the sales and give that to a broker rather than taking the actual bottom line, which can be completely different numbers. So depending on what he's asking for, uh, I would then make a judgment call. If it's just tax returns, then I would say that is very, very reasonable and very diligent. Emma, I hope that helps. So that's it for this week's Bearded Broker Live. <coughs> Excuse me, hopefully next week I'll be back in the office. <laughs> the way I'm feeling at the moment, I'm not sure. But if you've got any questions, if you're a first time buyer or you're looking to sell your house and buy a new house, then I'd love to hear your questions. Uh, happy to answer any questions mortgage related or property related 
and hopefully that has been of help today. So it's Ross Stisi from the Stisi Group. I'm known as the Bearded Broker. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe and even leave a comment below or a question below. That would be greatly appreciated as well. And we'll see you next week for another live session. Thanks very much. See you soon.